Evolutionary theory, its epistemology, actually sets the evidentiary threshold unbelievably higher than the rest of the sciences. An evolutionist is profoundly more rigorous as a scientist than your BS guy at doing his undergrad studies in the lab. Nomological networks of cumulative evidence is the idea that if you want to demonstrate that a phenomenon is in an adaptation, you have to look for as many disparate sources of lines of evidence. Not that you necessarily collect. This is not a literature review. So let me, if I give you a specific example, you'll get it. Uh, the waist to hip ratio of the hourglass figure is a adaptive preference that men hold. This is for women, right? The, idea, women. the idea that women who have Should an hourglass hold. figure exactly. are more attractive. Exactly. Okay. And so typically evolution psychologists, well not typically, evolution psychologists argue that the, the range is 0.68 to 0.72, which corresponds to the hourglass figure. So the waist to hip ratio, how do I demonstrate that it is adaptive? Well, first, I can offer you theoretical explanation that argues that sexual selection is the mechanism by which in a sexually reproducing species, males and females evolve certain preferences in the opposite sex. So there is a very clear theoretical mechanism that explains how that preference would have been coded. Okay. Now I'm going to give you medical data. Well, it turns out that women who exhibit that uh, ratio are healthier, are usually younger, we lose that shape as we get older, are more likely to conceive. So now I have very clear reproductive and medical currency that if you have that uh, shape, it results in the exact evolutionary calculus that we care about, which is you either reproduce or don't. Okay, now I'm going to show you data cross-cultural data, universal data, not from, only from your lab in Ohio State. I'm going to go to the Yanomama in, 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 in the Amazon, and I'm going to go to the Bedouin tribe in the Negev desert, and I'm going to repeat it in 50 cultures, and guess what? They're all going to show that that figure. So now look what I've gotten so far, and I'm going to give you a lot more. I've gotten you a box of theoretical data or explanation, then a medical reproductive stuff. Then I've gotten you cross-cultural human universals. Now I'm going to give you data where that preference was captured not only through paper and pencil tasks, tell me which of these per women you find most beautiful, I'm going to give you eye tracking data. I'm going to give you brain imaging data. Men's pleasure centers light up more neuronally when they are exposed to women who hold that preference. Now it seems like I'm really building a lot of data in support of what I'm saying. It sure doesn't sound like I'm just hand-waving bullshit arguments. Let's keep going. Now I'm going to get you data from prostitutes that shows that prostitutes who have that hourglass figure uh, can command larger fees. Now I'm going to show you data study done by me where you take, in, I did it 48 different countries. I had an undergraduate student code a data of female escorts who advertise themselves online. Uh, my name is Susie, uh, my height is this, my weight is this, here is my waist to hip ratio. So he did it for 48 different countries and guess what the figure came out to. Now some, some person will say, oh, but how about if they're lying? Who cares if they're lying? It doesn't matter if they're lying. The point is, what are they advertising, right? So let me repeat. Now I've gotten you theoretical data. I've gotten you medical data. I've gotten you cross-cultural human universal data. I've gotten you multiple methods data, right? Using brain imaging, using eye tracking, using paper and pencil tasks, right? I've gotten you prostitute data. I've gotten you online female escorts data. Now I'm going to get you data looking at content analysis of Playboy magazines and Miss America over many years, many decades. Do they all have that figure? It sounds like grueling work that no one would really want to do. <laughs> Actually, the, the undergraduate student in question, when he asked me to work on a project and I gave him this project, his response was, I love you, Professor Saad. <laughs> <laughs> That's the only appropriate response, I'm sure. Uh, so I'll just give you one or two. As a cis heterosexual male. This was a, heter a cis heterosexual male, exactly. Uh, so then uh, there is data looking at, uh, I think it was uh, Greco-Roman uh, 
uh, Indian data, African, uh, uh, these are uh, uh, traditions of art coming from antiquity, from Africa, from uh, India, where they took figurines uh, from 2,500 years ago and they can actually calculate the waist to hip ratio. It supports it. Right. Now I'm going to give you the coup de gras, the, the, the killer. If, if all this other data were not enough, you could take, you ready? Is everybody listening? <laughs> you could take congenitally blind men, men who have never had the gift of sight. Make them go through that preference task using what? Haptically, by touch. And guess what they choose? So does that sound like it is just so storytelling? No. So here's an academic person who says that evolutionary theory is nothing but just so storytelling when the exact opposite is the truth. So that's why it offends me and, and angers me.